Right, okay, I think we've given everyone a chance to come in. Um, brilliant. Video art background. Oh, wicked. That's really cool, Holly. Yeah, so, um, so like I said, please do ask questions as we go. Um, give us a bit of a sense. Obviously, we're all very used to doing Zoom stuff now, but <laughs> the more interactive we can make it, the better. Um, but we'll get, we'll get started and I will keep half an eye and see if there are other people. Um, oh, here we go. There, as I said it, uh, wanting to come in. Cool. Okay, so um, welcome everyone. This is the first of the Edit Girls Career Chats um, events that we're going to do. I say we're, um, it's actually when you see Edit Girls, it's me. Um, so my name's um, Kim French. Um, I'm based in London in the UK. I started Edit Girls about four years ago. I just had a look now. Um, and I did it because I was, I've started my career as an editor. So I worked similarly to Beth as a commercial editor, cutting music videos and, and TV ads. And I always found that I was often the only woman in the post houses that I worked in. And then four or five years ago, the production company I worked in, who also hires editors and, and visual effects artists, we were really struggling to get women um, to apply for jobs. And I was like, I know they're there, like, where are they? Um, and it turned out they were on Instagram. So um, like, I've really found, I found it quite interesting because I've wanted Edit Girls to be, um, not just solid to commercial editors. I, we shared TV editors, film editors, and I think it's really important because I think that you can learn so much from all these, from all these different disciplines and often they can be quite siloed, um, what I've learned anyway. Um, so today we're gonna talk to uh, Beth. Hold on, make sure we've got everyone in. Yeah, no waiting room. Um, so Beth is a commercial editor She's based in London. She currently works at Nomad, which is an award-winning editorial house uh, with offices in New York, London, LA, and Tokyo. She's worked with brands including Adidas, OnePlus, and TikTok, and has some brilliant music videos for artists including Eli Brown, Big Pig, and Mahalia. So Beth trained originally as a dancer, and you can really see it uh, in her work, her love for movement and rhythm and how things feel. Um, she's an incredible talent and she's also really lovely and I'm really excited to be able to chat to her. Hold on, letting more people in. Um, so, so like I said, so if anyone's, hopefully you're all sort of familiar, I've kept the format to Edit Girls the same for the last four years because it's been working really well. And we ask a series of questions. Um, the first one being, tell us about your job role. We'll let you speak as well, Beth. <laughs> Tell us about your job role and the kinds of projects you work on. So Beth, um, please, yeah, introduce yourself and, and tell us about what you do as a commercial editor. Well, hi, everyone. Thank you so much for taking the time to come to this this evening. Um, obviously, I'm, I'm Beth. I work at Nomad and kind of uh, what I'm doing mostly at the moment is working on commercials, branded content pieces, um, and music videos and things like that um, and yeah all mostly short form and also working on short films when I can which is super fun and um, I'm going to do it in a slightly different order but how, how did you how did you start editing like what um, what has been your journey um, did you go to university did you do an internship like how did you get into editing so if I go like all the all the way back, I was making stupid films on PowerPoint and Windows Movie Maker. Uh, <laughs> even before I really knew what editing was, I was always playing around with it. Um, and then I was training to be a dancer for a long time, realised that wasn't really going to work out for me. So I was trying to find something else I was kind of interested in that was similar, I suppose, or like had some sort of musical um kind of thing because I've always been obsessed with music um and so my friend actually 
um, was like, oh, I found this BTEC in, in media at college. Um, it looks really cool. Do you want to have a look at the spec? Because I know that you've got no fucking idea what you're going to be doing. And I was like, yeah, sure, why not? I kind of like taking photos sometimes. That sounds good. <laughs> um, and then, yeah, I went and did that and tried, got to try a little bit of everything in that. And then I started cutting on Avid straight away. Mm-hmm. For some reason, they had and they were like use this and I was like oh dear god what is this um had to sort of teach myself uh a lot of trying to kind of throw stuff in it and it not working so there's a lot of already like getting involved in the whole problem solving process really early on um and then yeah uh my tutor was like have you ever thought about doing this as a job like this bit and I was like "Mm." not really and he was like do you like it and I was like yeah to be honest I could sit here all day and the day just goes um and so he was like oh I think you should have a look into these courses um and he had a chat with me about Ravensbourne um and Salford in Manchester um and then Southampton Solon as well and looked at a couple of courses there and then ended up going to Ravensbourne did my degree um but whilst I was doing my degree I was already kind of trying to get in and working to try and figure out whether I actually really wanted to do it to be honest because I kind of got to uni and was like oh wow everyone already knows what they want to do and they're all already really good at it and I haven't got a clue what's going on like I had no idea what I'd got myself into so I was like I should probably try and figure this out pretty soon because I'm about to do three years of it and I don't know if I want to um so then started interning really and just freelance running and just trying to navigate what I'd got myself into and learn as much as I could about the process um and then was running at a kind of tv post facility because I was like oh well I I feel like maybe I should navigate towards what my course actually is um and that was a really stupid idea because I didn't understand the difference between a post facility and like a post house and and kind of how all that differentiates between long form short form etc um so it was basically just like working in a coffee shop but in a dingy little building with loads of men uh, <laughs> um, so I was doing that for a while and then balancing that whilst working in an actual coffee shop um, and then I figured that if I spent more time running um, at this TV facility I actually ended up having more time if I took my laptop in with me to just actually cut stuff whilst I was there and I was like get paid twice get paid twice I freelance I get paid twice and I do this and it's great (laughs) um work smarter not harder kind of vibes (laughs) um so did that so what were you cutting so I was I I was cutting a lot of stuff for uni Mm. and then I was cutting a lot of stuff because um at Ravensbourne I was part of the editing post class and there was a separate um degree that was digital film So I was cutting a lot of stuff for the digital film students for their projects and starting those relationships with people who like wanted to be directors, wanted to be producers, like, um, and so they were shooting stuff and then I was, I was cutting it. Um, so that was kind of a really good starting point of like figuring out how all of that worked and how to work with people in that way as well. Um, and then, yeah, I was sort of looking for, other work um and trying to get myself out of having to be a runner essentially because I was like well I'm kind of cutting stuff I want to try and continue doing that um and so I think I I ended up getting in touch with a load of people who like it's sort of snowballed like people who I'd worked with then started chatting to other people and becomes this whole word of mouth thing um, and I started working with a director who was just doing live sessions at the time. He's like the lives guy um, of four or five years ago. Uh, and we got on really well. And he was just like, do you want to just cut all of my stuff? And I was like, 
yeah sure so I just started doing live music videos um, and that was kind of the first time that I'd had proper experience like working with clients um, and then it just sort of snowballed a little bit more from there so then I could work less in the coffee shop focus more on my degree which I also just didn't do like I was there but I was never there <laughs> <laughs> it was sort of my buffer to be able to like be in London um I definitely had that in my third year as well certainly it was yeah it was a bit mad. more interested in actually getting the work yeah exactly mm. um and then it became yeah it just it snowballed quite a lot quite well and then I started meeting different people and they were kind of like well if you want to do this as your end goal and like you want to be doing music stuff or you want to be doing commercials or you want to be doing this and you kind of need to like go down the assisting route you kind of need to be an assistant like I know that you're cutting and you have clients but you kind of need to do that so then I sort of rejigged my path really um and started trying to figure out how I was going to get to do that um so just, I was just having a lot of conversations with people and also just emailing everybody being like, hi, I'm Beth, here's my reel, can I come and work for you, please? Mm -hmm. uh, <laughs> and I swear that there's so many people now that, um, that actually remember, like they'll like, I'll be chatting to them and I'll be like, oh, actually, like I actually know you because I sent you an email like, and we had a conversation like five years ago and they're like, oh, you're that Beth. The pastorer. <laughs> You've got to be a pastorer. Yeah, because I just wouldn't give up. I was like, mm. I, yeah, I was awful. I would email everybody and anybody and be like, can I please? Anything, anything you've got, doesn't matter. Um, I think so that yeah. attitude is so important, though. I think that, yeah, you just have to be able to put yourself out there. You talked yeah. about assisting. Am I right? So did you, who did you assist and what was that kind of? Um, so I started as an assistant advice, really, properly. And then also working for um, Flock Collective, mm. um, which brought me more into kind of the commercial world, which was interesting to see the difference because Vice was very like, like kind of like branded content. Um, whereas working for Flock, that was way more traditional old school commercial environment, very different vibes. Um, and I was kind of, I was freelanced still. I, I basically, I wanted to try and like get into Vice and have a full-time job there. Um, it didn't pan out that way. I ended up probably working out for the best, to be honest. Um, Cause I ended up being permalance there. Mm -hmm. So I was getting paid as a freelancer, but I was working continuously for them. Mm -hmm. um, and then I was kind of like, oh, I'm a bit like I hadn't even really graduated uni at this point. And I was like, oh, I'm a bit sick of this. Like, I want to be cutting stuff now a bit more. Like, I can do it. It'll be fine. And Vice were kind of like, you're assisting, you assist. And I was like, but I want to cut though. And they were like, mm, maybe, maybe, sure. So then I went and um, and ended up cutting, managing to get a conversation with BuzzFeed. And so I started cutting for BuzzFeed. And then I told Vice that I was cutting for BuzzFeed, which then in turn meant that I got some projects from Vice because I was like, that's your competitor. <laughs> It was a risky game. It was a risky tactic. Mm -hmm. And I know that um, Frank is literally, my boss at the time is literally listening in onto this today. So it's funny, it. probably funny hearing it from how I'm explaining it now. Um, but that was kind of like my plan. And I'm, I'm lucky that like, I think he rated that move, but somebody else probably wouldn't have done. Mm -hmm. um, so risky but paid off for me thankfully um but yeah and then I was chatting to the guys at flock and they were sort of like 
because I was like working between all these three places as my main clients as a freelancer and I was ch- chatting to the guys at Flock uh, with Ollie Stoffer who's absolutely fucking lovely yeah. helped me so much in my career actually took like literally trained me on Avid mm-hmm. um like I went to his house and he was like okay here's the basics let's go through all of this stuff you need to be able to know this to work for us but also for you to progress in your commercial career um yeah, he's always been a huge supporter of Edit Girls as well. Oh, he's hey, amazing. Ollie. He's he's insanely great. I have so much time for, for him. Um, and yeah, he really helped me with my career and my advice and everything. And I yeah, definitely super helpful. Um, and so he was saying to me, like, you want to get into commercial world and you want to be doing the big commercials. You need to know how to use Avid and you need to be in that environment, assisting in that environment to step up. And I was like, oh God, okay, fine. I guess I'm gonna have to do that. Uh, what were you cutting? Because you said you started in Avid, but then what were you cutting in when you were like doing this freelance stuff between Buzzfeed? Premier. And, you were using Premier. Yeah. So, um, yeah, because obviously, you know, we know that it's not about the tools; it's about what you do with it. But obviously, there are industries that have a specific um, software that they that they use. So yeah. So how was that then moving? knowing that you had to use Avid? Uh, scary, very scary. Because I'd used it, like I started on it in theory, but I was always using it wrong. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and it didn't like me very much. Um, and then at uni, they were like, use Avid. Here's Avid, use Avid. Let's do it. Let's do the Avid 101 exam and the 110. And I was like, cool, great. I hate this. This is awful. Um <laughs> And I kept trying to use it and just, it wasn't really clicking properly. Mm -hmm. Um, And I think you kind of almost need to use it in a proper functional environment with workflow and process to actually really get to grips with it properly. Mm -hmm. Um, But yeah, so I was, I was proper avid, uh, proper premier fangirl. Um, Is that what you use now? No. Uh. (laughs) Which is crazy because um i was always like premier's better premier's way better so good love it it's amazing um i think it's great but i really wish there was a combi of certain things from premier and certain things from avid as one thing and then it would be the dream mm-hmm. system um but yeah so i was kind of pretty scared about using avid I was like, oh, because I basically, I kind of, Ollie basically was like, go and work at Marshall Street Editors. I know the guys. We can get you in there. It's fine. Um, You'll figure it out. And he sort of trained me enough to know that I would probably be okay. But I was like, I've told them I know how to use Avid and I don't. (laughs) So I was like, I'm going to, I proper, like, I'm going to get found out here. Mm -hmm real fast um and I went in and to be fair I was like I was okay I was better than I thought I was going to be but thankfully there was another assistant there and I was brutally honest with her on like day two I was like listen I haven't got a fucking clue what I'm doing can you just fill me in I promise I'll pick it up but just don't say anything (laughs) um and it was totally fine and I was I was within like two weeks I was up to speed Mm -hmm. and I was comfortable um and I'd also only really assisted in one one place before like that like there was obviously like different like fully assisted full time so in in vice so like their workflow and process was a particular way um and then going to Marshall Street it was a completely different kind of fish because it's always different because everyone always works differently um so that was kind of also a bit of a a learning curve for that um so how long were you there how long were you at marshall street uh about 18 months or so Mm -hmm. so like not long long enough for being in for me personally for being in that kind of old school commercial environment um they were great i learned like a lot from being there and I think the discipline I got from that process was amazing um I think it's like 
quite important to have that to be able to like be flexible and work with lots of different editors in lots of different ways because everyone works differently Mm -hmm. um and being able to be kind of quite technically savvy um i think that was quite a question actually which might sort of relate to that technical side of things um around what so hannah's asked um what the majority of your responsibilities were as an assistant editor so in that in that period of time um, yeah so essentially um essentially sort of occasionally transcoding but like prepping loading syncing grouping breaking things down basically kind of making everything well organized for the editor to be able to come in and just get hands on and start cutting make sense and also be I think one of the main things uh, with doing that is making sure that you've got like all of the pre-prod paperwork to help you break that down properly so that it makes sense to what the director is going to be talking about when they come in the room Mm -hmm. as well as it making sense to what the rushes are and how things look and how things are processed Mm -hmm. Um, but it's also kind of dealing with having to do rough offline comps which um, I'll be honest I never I always blagged that someone else always did mine because I just couldn't do them (laughs) What, what do you mean? What do you mean that you can do so like comping things and working and like um, it's my, out and putting it in just to get yeah. visual, visual effects? Yeah, it's my it's my one thing that I'm just absolutely shit at. I've really tried. I even went and did a course with um, I can't remember what they're called now, but there's like a quite a famous um, VFX uh, like training program. Um, and I went and did like a mini course with them and they were just like, just let it go. Like, this is not for you. <laughs> it's interesting because um, like I mentioned before, before we started, there was someone asking on, on email, like prior to this about how important visual effects are when it comes to editing and how much you need to know and how much you can get away with. And, you know, how do you feel in terms of, because by the sounds of it, perhaps it isn't something, yeah. How, how do you, when you have a, because I know that you've worked on projects that are very um, post heavy, like the OnePlus headphones, and how do you approach visual effects when it comes to your edits? Um, so I try and concentrate more on timings. Mm-hmm. Um, and also I've been quite lucky in terms of, well, I say lucky, I've also navigated this it this way specifically because I know it's my weak spot. So I've worked with companies that have post teams. Mm-hmm. So when I did the OnePlus stuff, I was at Agile and they have their own VFX studio and the director is like one of the best VFX guys ever. So he just, I'd go, cool, these are the takes. This is where the timings are. How do you feel about that? He would, we'd both, and I learned a lot from him through doing that with him, but um, he would then temp comp it. So it looked pretty much done to offline and then ping it me back. And then I'd just make sure that my sequences were relevant. So when everything everything went to grade, it was all identical. So if he made any changes, we'd bring it all back Mm -hmm. so that the conform would go smoothly um, and things like that. And then it's sort of this similar situation with Nomad, really. I mean, my assistants thank God, know how to comp. Uh, So they carry me with that. Um, And then we also have a VFX team. So because we have that, I can go and have conversations with people who actually really know what they're talking about and understand it. And then I get to learn alongside that and I can hold my own with having conversations about how it's going to look. Mm -hmm. Um, So would you say that, you know, when it comes to you don't necessarily have to know everything you just have to have a good understanding and be collaborative and be able to speak the language you know okay a tiny bit of uh you know blagging it but actually over time you learn and you figure out um how things go because you've learned from each job that you yeah Absolutely. And I think I, you know, I also had an instance where a producer called me and was like, hi, we're doing this music video and it's all like tracking kind of like that 
bonobo one that was done with the big space of the rooms and it's going to be like this it's going to work like this and what do you think how are we going to do that how are we going to do how are we going to do it and I was like what do you mean <laughs> she was like how how are we going to shoot it <laughs> can you give me some like just need your advice on how you would approach it and then approach it in the edit and then approach it in the afters. Mm -hmm. And I was like, oh, okay. And then talk through everything I could possibly know and pinpoint from a job. But I was also like, please make sure that you discuss this with the DP, mm -hmm. another offliner and a VFX team to make sure that everything that you're doing is aligned. And it's about having that collaborative workflow communication at the beginning of pre. But people still call me thinking, I know what I'm talking about with stuff like that. So I must be doing something okay. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you are and, and also you bring together these I think an editor is really about bringing together all of these elements as well and, and saying you need to speak to you you know making sure the right people are connected and um so, so Laura just asked about um whether you would ever have gotten into grading or was it an interest or or was yes, it always editing um, um, so when I first came to uni, I had no idea what grading was at all. Mm -hmm. Someone had to actually sit me down and explain it to me. Because I kept my job. I was like, guys, what is this grading thing? Like, when does that happen? What is that? <laughs> um, and then I ended up, I actually was uh, Cheat's first ever intern oh. when it was just Joe and Toby. And I think it was Lily at the time. Mm -hmm. um, and so I've known those guys for a really long time. And Joe, actually, Joe and Toby were people who gave me a lot of advice, even though we ended up, like, I ended up not going into colour at all. Mm -hmm. um, but just knowing them and having those conversations and um, they really supported the beginnings of my career. And, and we had a lot of really good conversations um, about stuff. But I... I basically was really interested in it because I was like, oh, I can just listen to music all day. I, I was going to say exactly <laughs> and I felt the same way when I was you know we play around in After Effects I was like I can just have a podcast on and yeah. be getting on with work whereas editing is so all-consuming and you need to be listening to the music and listening to the dialogue that there's no room for that other stuff is there yeah totally and I think that's also why I tried to have mm -hmm. a go at doing VFX because I was like these are the same 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 but different yeah um and I watched I genuinely sat in and watched Joe grade and he grades like people type mm. and I was like oh, okay so I'd have to really start again to be any good at this mm -hmm. and then like and like Joe grades by a kind of a feeling and how things feel so like that resonated with me and I got that um and that was kind of how I felt about cutting um Toby was very, very technical and looks more at the waveforms than mm. he does at, um, at how things feel so much. Mm -hmm. um, and I kind of realised that I knew way more about cutting at that point than I thought I ever would about colour. Mm -hmm. And that's kind of when I knew that I'd pick the right thing because I actually was kind of in a working environment with people as an intern but felt comfortable in how much I already knew at what I was doing mm -hmm. um, and could hold my own in those conversations and so that kind of gave me weirdly like obviously shut a door on one idea but gave me confidence in what I was doing yeah no it makes perfect sense I think often finding out what you don't want to do sets you on the right path absolutely um, so did you so in terms of your because you you say you know, a pivotal moment in your career and a highlight has really been your signing to Nomad. So how long have you been, did you go from Marshall Street Editors to Nomad or was there what? Uh, uh, no, so I went to Agile. That's it, yes. Um, In-house as an editor there and they're a production company primarily, yeah. but they do have their own kind of like sister post, post situation. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, so I was there for- situation yeah post situation they do a bit of everything mm -hmm. um like absolutely everything they've had a go at doing and they have teams for and they all they know like a lot of the best freelancers to bring in and things like that mm -hmm. um but they be they became more of a department as I sort of grew with them 
which was really nice to see. Um, but yeah, I think I spent two years there before mm -hmm. I got signed with Nomad. Um, and then I've been with Nomad since the back end of last summer. Yep. So how did that happen? Like, how did you know? Did you approach them? Did they approach you? How did that signing? Because that's um, a deal, right? I mean, that's your. Is that like officially your first sort of on a roster? Yeah. 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 So it how is. Did that happen. Um, they approached me, and I kind of had a lot of other like options floating about. I was kind of like, mm, I might go freelance. Mm. Mm, I might take a step backwards and go into long form um I was sort of navigating what I was going to do next and they approached me and I had a couple of conversations with a couple of other people in other places as well which was kind of strange it was it's one of those things where like when you speak to other editors about it it's weird because like you kind of just know when you're going to get signed mm -hmm. like something shifts and you get feelings and feelers put out from certain people and certain people start interacting with you, especially online. Um, and the interest is shown a little bit heavier. And it was so interesting because I never really had thought about it, but it's one of those things where like the process is that they will always approach you and you can't really do anything about it. Mm -hmm. I couldn't have fast tracked that really. Yeah. Um, I mean, I did everything I possibly you know, like you knowing me, I did everything I possibly could to try and fast track that mm -hmm. um, by talking to EPs of offline houses and turning up at events and being like, oh, hi, yeah, I'm doing this now. I'm not sure what I'm going to do next. Uh, <laughs> hint, hint. Just, hint, hint. Um, yeah. And so I ended up having a lot of conversations with quite a few different people. And different editors as well and letting editors that I respected know that like I wasn't sure what I was going to be doing next so that they could like so if there was any feelers from anyone from certain offline houses then it was good um do you think that played a part like do you you know for someone looking to get to have that you know career path and again obviously we're really talking about commercial world here mm. it's a mix of put your head down building a reel but the networking side and you know um I often I remember assisting and, and finding that really intimidating like that idea of networking and the relationships that you have to build with directors in order to be able to get the work you know and the, and the, and the amazing footage that makes you look better like what is that perfect kind of formula um for that sort of stuff like how do you build those relationships um i don't know if there really is any perfect formula everyone's narrative's different um i think everyone's kind of the way that it sort of snowballs and the way that um it's just a it's, it, i feel like it's just a domino effect really of like you do a good job for one person yeah and then they talk to you talk about you to other people that they know and so on and so on and it ends up just being once you get started and you've kind of done that first step the rest of it becomes quite a lot easier I think um but I do know that there's a lot of people who've just kind of who just are immaculate editors and don't really bother with the social side but it doesn't matter um because people just go well they're just really fucking good um and then I feel like I do, I, but I, I personally do feel like having those connections and building those connections and those relationships does get you into a better place faster. Um, so yeah, it's definitely a bit of a mixed bag. It's about building trust, isn't it really? Yeah, it you is. You really have had to have the perfect piece in your reel, but if you've built some trust, the director will give you a chance and then absolutely and I think people genuinely just kind of want to work with people that they like or get on with or that you've got yeah, so common true. with somebody like you know if you spent your if you're cutting and you're doing a job and it takes two weeks they're like the director ultimately is going can I sit in a room for two weeks with her or him or them like that's kind of 
what the first headspace is because yeah. you can if, if you're a good director as well you can like help draw a good edit out so it doesn't necessarily like as long as you're getting on with somebody it doesn't necessarily matter so much if they're not if they're if they're a bit more green because you, you as a good director you can pull that out of them and help them progress as well and also there's vice versa in that if you've got a green director but as an editor you really feel like you know what you're doing with the piece you can help them bring the best out of it and it's just it's just about that teamwork really and how those connections form and yeah that trust I love that I can I can hear my soundbite already and what you <laughs> said I'm like I'm gonna cut there and do that bit. um so in terms of um the the kind of i'm just going back to my questions a bit because i want to make sure we're kind of covering everything um and if anyone has any other questions for beth please pop them in the chat don't be shy um let's talk a little bit about your like the specific pieces of work as well so we we sort of agreed that we wouldn't necessarily show things that we all know that things you know the videos just are a bit and da, da, da. but you can all see beth's work um on the nomad website which I'll share in an email afterwards. I've also shared in some of the emails um, leading up to this. So what has been like a really, like what's been a piece of work on your, on your reel that, yeah, you're super proud of, um, that you really enjoyed the process and you're happy with the final result, you know, everything, the stars aligned. Um, I don't think there's ever all the, all the I was going to say, all the boxes don't like get the corner. All right, which is your favorite piece? Forget the process. What is your favorite piece of work? Like what is one of your standout pieces of work? I think my, oh, so tricky. I think my favorite is probably the Adidas spot that I did. Mm -hmm. Because it's kind of such a mix of everything. Um, and it was difficult at times. Oh, we've lost you. Um, but it, oh. Your, your connection just went. Say that last bit again. Oh, sorry. It's all right. Um, yeah, I feel like it was kind of a good mix of like, it didn't go, like it didn't go perfectly, but like it was so worth doing and it felt like a really good piece and we had to like take a break from it and then come back to it and there was problems with the client, but ultimately we still managed to make something that felt really great. And I think it is for me also it was so that I really enjoyed that one because it was working with um a creative director who just just trusted me, just got to a point where he trusted me and we've worked together again since um, and I really enjoy working with him um, because he like it's a, it's sometimes it's those jobs that like you've got a good creative on mm -hmm. and it, it it just works and it just clicks a bit differently and they're trusting you and and their feedback helps you make it better not the other not worse it's like I look forward to the notes because we're on the same page mm. and that's such a strange it's rare so I really enjoyed it for that reason um and it was also one of those things where it was like it was musically led and I was dealing with a composer so there was a lot of back and forth with that and I was having to sort of cut and recut to the new tracks um took ages to sign anything off with that so there was that was why the process got extended because it like i was like it has to be right because it's so sound heavy it's so important that everything is aligned um and then also getting all the archive signed off was yeah. I was gonna ask, yeah. A bit of a nightmare. Yeah, I bet. <laughs> like, see, yeah, yeah, something like that, like the rights to things, I guess. And so yeah. did you have an assistant on that project or no? So I did everything myself. Yeah. We've got Even actually a question. Um we've got a question from Rachel about that, about how, like how long did it take? So obviously you went back to it, but what was the time scale for that project? I think collectively the project existed for like three months, mm -hmm. which is a long time for 60. <laughs> but um, 
I, we didn't cut for that long. I think I had to do the first, first sort of proper cut in a, in like a couple of days. Yeah. So it's more to do with the environment. Like you could probably have cut that in a week or two, you know, but actually it's all the things going on around it. Yeah. Um, absolutely. Some other questions. Um, what have been, I love this one. Did you ever have any memorable failures or major challenges, um, tough relationships with directors, <laughs> specifically demanding projects? We won't obviously name any names or anything or projects, you know, um, but what do you, what have they been, uh, you know, as vague as you like, um, and then how have you overcome those challenges? Have you overcome those challenges? <laughs> yeah, have I, oh, who knows? Um, I, t I tend to quite specifically surround myself with people that I really like and I enjoy spending time with in the suite and work with people that I think are, are nice people because generally there's always a fallout of people that you don't really fucking want to be working with off the back of that anyway um so at least having that trust and like enjoying the directors that I work with and things like that's quite important but I've definitely worked with people who are difficult, like to play, um, pin the blame on the editor, <laughs> uh, <laughs> which is always a really fun one to have to deal with. But I'm trying to think of stuff that's like more specific. Um, I think, Dealing with difficult people is kind of, it's every single day on the job, really. Um, and knowing how to navigate that properly. I think I'm, I've got better with age. Um, but the main thing I struggle with is I get talked over a lot. Mm -hmm. um, especially in particular environments, because I'm quite young there's like almost a little bit of a lack of respect sometimes, um, which is fair. Um, is it though? Well, I like I- um, There's value in everyone. This is why as well, I mean, I know yeah. obviously I share a whole range of career stories, but I think it's so important people, like women at the beginning of their careers to share their stories, you know, a year in, two years, mm. there's value in that. And then there's value in 20 years, you know? Yeah. I think I'm, oh, by saying it's fair, I mean like, I understand yeah. why. Like it makes sense, but it's really fucking annoying. Mm -hmm. um, and it is difficult to navigate because I think sometimes I then go into a space of self doubt, if I'm being totally honest, when those situations happen. And then I have to really pull myself back from that kind of, um, that kind of thing. But I've, I've done some really stupid stuff like lose rushes yeah um back when i was running i spilled a coffee on a higher house's cream carpet never thought i never thought i'd come back from that one i think the main thing i've learned is like you can come back from a lot of the failures that you make and they actually just make you stronger um and learn what to not do again i was working with um i was assisting jinx godfrey and absolutely phenomenal woman I have so much respect for her she taught me a lot but right at the beginning of the job we weren't getting on well um because I was so worried I was like this is Jinx Godfrey I have to be perfect I have to be doing this amazingly and I'm so not ready for this um so I was super nervous and that just came out and then I made a mistake on something and she lost her shit at me um and I was like oh god how do I deal with that now so I like took a minute, cleared my head about it, and then was like, right, I'm gonna be, I'm gonna, I, I, it doesn't matter now because technically she hates me. So if I'm amazing now, by like on the fallout, nothing's gonna change. And we ended up building an amazing relationship through that job. So sometimes it's also like trying not to let your insecurities kind of come out and like, um what's the word I'm looking for kind of like stifle you I suppose yeah I've had things where I thought it's the end of the world like that's it, it just I'm never isn't. working this town again blah 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 
And actually you have to ask yourself, will this matter in five years? And if it doesn't matter in five years, then, you know, or no. five weeks or five, but like, it hurts and it, it's it's hard and it gets you right there like when they happen yep. but most things you can come back from we've got some other questions and i'm conscious of time so i really want to make sure um cover sorry i do just ramble on no it's it's great um i've loved it um i think that hold on a second so this is a a deep one um have you faced issues being a woman working in post-production so yeah yeah and how would you pinpoint them um what have they been um kind of i, I suppose kind of what what you what you think it might be like it is mm -hmm. um it is better there have been improvements um i think i actually tend to suffer a lot more for being young than I do for my gender um, because it's the whole respect thing and time um, and having proof of the pudding, you know, experience speaks volumes um, and that only really comes with time for people. Um, but yeah, I think there's still a lot of work left to be done and it's definitely always something that I question and have to go well am i getting this because of this or mm. why is this kind of like why is this attitude coming towards me in this way is it because of that am i reading into it too much how much is it that space how much is it my age how much is it this so it is definitely something difficult to navigate it's probably something that i probably don't want to go too much into because it's, mm. it's like there's there've been quite a lot of like personal it's quite situations. triggering isn't it it's like quite yeah. triggering subjects and i think it is yeah but um, it's it's something to like just be mindful of but also know that there are spaces and places where you can yes. talk yeah um and edit girls being one of those places so i think it really is to find that group of women whatever you know again they're out you know they're out there make sure you, you you've got you know people that you can talk to um we've got some cool i'm gonna just be a little bit um fussy about some of these questions there's some really really great ones that are like just more about the process so um mm -hmm. can you talk a little bit because again it's so obvious from your work just the importance that music um is to you i think for you know any editor really but how do you choose music how do you work with composers um when you give input to composers how do you know what you need from them you know how does that do you always work with composers to create stuff or sometimes um you know ready-made tracks what mm. is that when you have a blank slate of a project how do you approach the music side it's always the biggest battle i go where's the track and they go we don't know yet and i go well this is based on the music <laughs> Yeah, and then you do an amazing cut to a track you love, and then afterwards they go, "Can we try some different, can like, can change the music? All. Just a small thing, right? Mm. Just change all the music." I had this, or I've had this on so many jobs, and I think the main thing that I've learned to do from that is pick stuff that is tonally right and is the right speed, pace, um, and probably a similar genre, and try and go down the overall arc and idea of it and then also creating kind of a structure with the track start middle end or start lift drop up down out um based on kind of the concept of the edit and the narrative that you're trying to tell and trying to recreate that um, as best as possible with music and then hopefully then we get a composer to kind of replicate the structure and then obviously that can then be discussed in terms of what genre, what instruments, et cetera. And trying to just make sure that I'm working in seconds, but also counting in time. Um, in terms of like what sort of musical time base, roughly. And a lot of it, I just sort of let myself feel um, because that's how, how I work. Um, and that's kind of now what my approach is to handling 
music stuff like that because I'll I'll generally get given a whole list of tracks and go hi here's all the all the options and they're all completely different cut with them and then we'll just figure it out later um and people forget how much that actually affects the cut <laughs> um I think but, the structure thing is so important I can almost see, I can, well I can see it in my mind like that space 30 seconds 60 seconds whatever it is and then you see the music do what you need it to do yeah and you yeah you you cut that track down first you don't just start going oh here's a three minute song I'm gonna you know just start editing you make sure you cut the track first um yeah that's awesome very well yeah. put um Oh, here's, here's, a, here's a nice one. Um, any tips on being a first time runner? So someone right at the start, um, yeah. How do, you, how do you ensure you make the right impression? I think being eager to help and also like finding spaces to go one extra step. I think that's what I always try to do is like going that extra mile without getting in the way. You kind of sort of need to almost be invisible but very helpful at the same time. <laughs> Um, fine line isn't it yeah it's a very fine line to walk and it's quite difficult um but yeah it's just about kind of listening a lot and then arriving in spaces where they need you or sorting things before they've even got to the being so involved in it that you're sorting things before they've even had to ask and that sort of goes as well in terms of being an assistant, I think, is being so in tune with the job that you kind of know where it's going to go and you're prepared for all outcomes and being able to be ready and have done stuff and prepped stuff. So when the editor or whoever turns around and goes, oh, hi, can I have this? You go, yeah, 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 cool, it's ready. I've actually done that. I foresaw that this was going to be, so here you go. There's nothing better than having having that and being able to be that um, for somebody else. I remember assisting and being in a position where the editor I worked for was like, you are the one, you're the first one with the rushes, you need to go red flag if there's something missing or not, right? never be afraid of speaking up uh, about something that doesn't look right or, you know, um, I think that stuff is really important. So hopefully Imogen is helpful. Um, so we're super close to nine o'clock, but I personally like, yeah, I have loads of questions and I know there are a few more here still. So Beth, I mean, do you, are you happy like spending a few more minutes just answering the rest of Yeah, absolutely. absolutely. Um, so, okay, one here. So how do you <laughs> juggle having to do an edit when you have multiple interviews? Um, so the example here from, um, hopefully I'm pronouncing this right, um, Duda is like more than 20 interviews and the creative has not done a paper edit and the footage wasn't exactly filmed for the project you were briefed to edit. Why do I feel like this is something that's very raw for her? Oh, yeah, it feels like <laughs> real. happening right now. Um, yeah, so how, how do you juggle uh, something like that with lots of interviews? Have you worked on a piece that has lots and lots of interviews or, or do you mostly have things that are shot specifically i have <laughs> i have um <laughs> yeah currently dealing with this task yeah. ask. fair play i yeah i've worked on um on stuff with lots of interviews and i think i think the main thing is still going through that same process of building a paper edit and making sure that you're building the narrative of like what the end goal should be like what the story you're trying to tell is and how all of those things connect and navigate together um and i think also be brutal if you've got that much then just start chopping it away and i think it, it for me i think with the interview stuff it's part of the process like you've just got to shrink it shrink it move on shrink it again move on shrink it again and then you know also getting to know what you've got because then you might be able to be like oh actually I'm pretty sure they said this at this point and that actually makes more sense and connects with what I've just put here and here and will build that gap for me um and so making notes as you go as well and kind of be a part of kind of thinking about it in that way um but yeah I think trying to handle it almost like you're going through a list because you kind of have to get through all of the stuff and the more that you know the rushes as well 
the quicker you'll be down the line. I think that's that's the key thing that I've found. You can't shortcut it, can you? You have to watch them all. <laughs> you have to really know it. I sometimes like you could even do double speed, you know, you can so long as you listen to every piece yeah. that they've said so you know it, you have it banked in your head. Um I mean, hopefully there's transcript speed. Yeah. Hopefully there's transcripts. Doesn't and sound hopefully. like there is <laughs> on this project. Um, no, that's really good advice. Um, and then I think there's just a couple more. So um, how many years have you been working as an editor since graduating? Is one of the questions from Holly. Uh, properly, officially under edit title for two and a half three mm -hmm. three years yep um but i guess i i graduated and it own and it took me two years post-grad to get into that position as, as being a full-time editor that's also bearing in mind I'd done the full three years of trying to um, kind of assisting and doing my degree and running and trying to follow. There that was a lot of parallel time. stuff, wasn't there? You were like, going to do my degree and then you were yeah. already building that side of things. Yeah, I had no, had no money, so I had to make some money. <laughs> okay, sorry, I've just got a cough, so I'm going to mute myself. <laughs> let's see what else we've got in here it's two years assisting so uh, yeah roughly um probably more like two and a half ish i would say but probably like a year and a half in avid and a year and a half two years in would you say that's quite a normal sort of path or did you do you think you, you got quite a quick opportunity or oh, it's quick yeah it very like quick <laughs> very, very quick most people yeah. assist for seven eight years um yeah. is the reality of it um and i think that's because it's very very difficult to cut and assist at the same time um you know when i was at marshall street in the commercial world i wasn't really getting to cut that much outside of that because my I was doing horrendous overtime mm. on my main job which is why I decided to t go down a different route and be an editor in, in a post house because then I could also freelance um, and so that's what I was doing I was sort of consistently cutting outside of hours and also for agile and they let me do that which a lot of places wouldn't so I was very lucky in that instance as well but also asked those right questions to be able to make sure that I could do those things without upsetting anybody. Yeah, it is a, it is a real balance, isn't it? Because if it starts encroaching on your assisting, then that's a problem. But then I think if a post house isn't nurturing assistants to become editors, then what are they doing kind of thing? Um, okay, have I missed any? Mm -hmm. oh, sorry if I've missed any ones, I'm trying to keep up. Um, okay, Liv, um, has one I'll make this one of the, one of the last ones um do you have any advice for negotiating your rate on a project obviously right now you're not involved in that really because you're, you're at the post house and it's kind of separate um i'm starting to realize that myself and other young women in post um around me are consistently offered very low rates and expected to take them without discussion do you recommend billing hourly or flat rate on a project? So obviously back to your freelance sort of mm. any freelance working that you did. What are your thoughts on that? Um, yeah. Can you, can you comment on that? Um, I think I would definitely familiarize yourself with rate cards and what other people are sort of, what's, what everyone's sort of standard rates are um, and what people are billing at. Also discussing, you know, rates with other freelancers that are doing similar work to you and where they're at. And then kind of trying to figure that out and kind of being like, okay, well, you want to offer this, that's fine. I can do it for X amount, which is potentially more because actually standard industry rate is this. So 
kind of doing you a favor but then it helps you push and progress your rate up without you being like i'm worth loads of money now overnight um and trying to kind of navigate and balance the kind of business side of it and being valuable in still trying to maintain getting work but slowly sort of pushing yourself up the scale basically that would be how i would and have navigated it i think that's great advice um okay a couple more and we'll we'll call it a day at 10 past nine because i know everyone's got their evening and i do have a thai takeaway waiting for me um but i'm enjoying this so what would you say are the pros and cons of working on short form so you did say about one point there being that moment in your career where you thought okay do i go long form take a step back you kind of said i'm imagining sort of yeah relearning a bit you know assisting in that or do you carry on with short form branded content commercial work music videos um what are the what are the pros and cons on those or do or can you even talk about the pros and cons because you've not necessarily worked in long term long -term. yeah i think um i know a lot of people that do so i have a rough gauge for the differences i've had a lot of discussions with people who've done it but i don't actually have first-hand experience so it's hard for me to to say fully um because i don't personally know how it feels to have those differences um but it's something that's always on my mind about my process and what i want to do and what matters to me in terms of my career and my longevity whether i want to get into long form or not is always a ping pong question that keeps coming back to me um i think i would really like to have the ability to have more space and time to be creative in an edit and think a little bit more get some space to breathe because a lot of short form schedules just don't allow for you to have that it's like we need it now 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 yesterday and then we need this this and this tomorrow and it's like well <laughs> okay <laughs> um you never really get enough time to process and to think things through and i think with longer form you get a little bit more time to do that the creatives kind of like um that side of it's a little bit more important or deemed to be more important um in in that side whereas the branded side's a little bit more keeping people happy focused in terms of appeasing everybody and coming to a middle ground but i do think um some of the this is, might be a controversial opinion but some of the better long form editors also have done short form because 100%. there's a certain set of skill set that you need from that that really just applies and reapplies and helps you be better and quicker and focused at different times um, in longer form stuff and think about things in a different way. Because in short form, you have to think like a create like creatively and story wise, but quicker. So then when you get the space to get more time to do that, you just get to the end point a little bit faster and and you can actually delve into it and dissect it a little bit more i think yeah makes total sense okay last one how do you find your style of editing so how have you seen that kind of evolve over your career and do you feel that you have a definitive style that they can yeah that you can pinpoint um i think i probably do have a style i don't necessarily see it i don't feel like i see it um and i also try and sort of like i have certain ways and my approach is the same and uh things that i like to do and stylistic choices in cutting that i like to repeat um but i do think that i spend a lot of time trying to make sure i'm navigating making sure my work is diverse because of my gender and my age i want to make sure that I'm sort of unquestionable when it comes to jobs. So I try and make sure that I'm doing lots of different types of things. So I think it's been hard for me to really pinpoint my own style within that because I'm trying to be a little bit more malleable and moldable and be able to cut lots of different styles and different things. Um, but I definitely feel like my whole approach is always about how it feels to watch. Like if I put shots together and my gut goes, yeah, feels great that, 
then they work and I'm not going to think too hard about the rules of it. Um, and I think that's my main approach for trying to make it feel emotional because if I can watch something back and go, oh, that made me feel something and I've seen it a thousand times, then I kind of know that at least what I'm doing, someone else is going to get something out of that piece and trying to make branded content and commercials feel like something or be a bit more meaningful that's kind of my whole approach to it all i think that's a perfect way to end be unquestionable i love that and diversifying <laughs> what you do you know don't um yeah ha have the things that that you like to, to to do and to work but each piece is its own thing isn't it so yeah Oh, thanks so much, Beth. Um, thank you guys so much. We've it's had been some lovely <clears throat> Excuse me. We've had some nice feedback. So um, yeah, I really hope people have enjoyed it. Um, we have recorded this, so I will uh, I will make sure that we get some nice snippets and we'll get the whole thing up somewhere. Um, I yeah, we will do more as well. Um, let me know who you want us to chat to, but yeah, I'm so happy that you were, you were the inaugural, is that the right word? You were the first one, Beth, so yeah. Thank you so much, it's been an absolute honour, uh, and thank you guys for taking the time. Yeah, thanks everybody.